I would like to officially welcome Miko on the stage. Uh, welcome today, Miko, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Kelvin. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and welcome everyone on, on my behalf as well. I can echo what Kelvin said. I'm, I'm open to any questions in the, in the chat. Let's make it fun and, and as, uh, as much of a dialogue as we, we possibly can. But yeah, thanks for having me, Kelvin. Awesome, awesome. All right. Uh, everybody is, in, is interested to learn more about, you know, what is happening with Slosh, uh, the plans for this year, how things have been going within the past couple of months or uh, years. But before we dive right into Slosh, it would be nice to understand the face behind the brand, you know, who you are as a person and probably what you've done be before Slosh. So in a, if you can tell us, what, when exactly did you join Slosh and what did you do before you joined Slosh? Just a bit about your background. Definitely, I can start there. Um, the answer to the, the question you hinted at is I, I joined Slosh in, in, in 2019, but perhaps we can uh, start a little further back than that. Um, so, so first of all, what, what needs to be said is, is Slush is a, a student-run event, so I'm, I'm pretty young, I just turned 25 yesterday, so I, I certainly hope that the, the more interesting things I'm going to do are still ahead of me rather than behind me. But uh, with, with that being said, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm born and raised here in Finland uh, from bilingual family, so that's uh, Finnish and, and, and Swedish. I don't think anything too particular about my like early childhood. Um, I think the the first point at which my sort of life maybe slightly deviated from like the average path of a, of, a, of a Finnish youngster was when my my mom had uh, had be become absolutely convinced that uh, going to an international high school is, is is the way to go. That's what you need to do. So that's what I did. I I, I did the uh, the IB the international baccalaureate. And I, I think a couple of things happened to me in high school. Um, number one. Um, I think I found people uh, who were like-minded in academic sense. Like I had always quite enjoyed school. I'd been pretty good in school. And I think for the first time I had other people around me who did the same. And then I think the second thing that happened is, uh, you know, obviously the, the IB is sort of filled with, you know, uh, sort of uh, children of expats, of people who aren't of, of sort of Finnish origin at all necessarily. Um, and, and a lot of people who take it as the uh, sort of uh, given option to, uh, to go and study abroad. Um, and, and, and that's what I did as well after, after high school. I, I applied to, to the UK and to the US. So I ended up in the, in the UK studying engineering um, only to within my first year realize that sort of hardcore engineering, which, which I thought was going to be my passion, wasn't. Uh, I'm going to do something or like maybe the, the better answer there was um, like, like I had always sort of been pretty good at math. I had always been interested in how the world works. And I thought like somewhere in the intersection between those is like engineering where you can apply, you know, math to real world problems. But eventually um, I don't feel like it gave me kind of the degrees of freedom to move around uh, in, in life that I wanted. It still put me on this pretty linear path in a, in a certain direction that I didn't like. So, so I actually ended up changing course and I, I transferred back home to, to all to study industrial engineering and management, which uh, I think even though it has the, the sort of word engineering uh, probably isn't uh, an, an engineering degree. Uh, it's, it's much more close. It's much closer to a business degree. And uh, yeah, during my, my, my years at IEM, I, I eventually like, cause Aalto is obviously the, the birthplace of slush. So you almost inevitably come in some, some kind of contact with slush. Um, and, and I guess my path was unconventional in the way that I actually never volunteered at the event before, before joining in 2019. So in, instead I had done a couple of sort of marketing internships in, in my sort of early student years. And uh, in the fall of 2018, and ended up discussing with Slush, um, who had a couple of openings in, in in their marketing team for the following year, and and and, and so I joined their their marketing team, like as a as a junior marketer in 2019. And what has happened since then is is obviously that since Slush is a, a student run organization that I think is willing to give sort of exceptional amounts of freedom and responsibility onto very young individuals, and also a team where the sort of rotation is pretty quick. Our, our average career as a full time employee is less than two years. Uh, that also means that you can carve your way sort of up the organization pretty quickly. So uh, I've changed roles a couple of times, done some internal roles, uh, including sort of strategy and, and, and sort of business insights. Um, then a couple of external roles, including investor and startup relations. And as of January of this year, uh, I am in my in my current role. So yeah, I guess that's the the short version. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for thanks so much for that intro. At least even for, from my own perspective, it gives a lot of. Uh, info into your background and you know who you are because i know when people think about you know the president of slush they'll probably be thinking ah okay maybe he's been there for like i don't know five ten years and he's been a volunteer for three four five years and you know he knows it all that's why he was able to get into that position but like you said 
yours was more like an unconventional way and even the way you got into the whole scene but yeah so you officially started uh, working as the president of slush did you say this january okay so when you when you say the president of slush what does the role really entail because i tend to to confuse it with let's say uh, uh director or maybe ceo or president so if you can explain to so like what does the role really entail and what do you do on a daily basis? No, it's a, it's a relevant question. I think even the wider startup ecosystem, the president role is is used quite fluidly. Uh, in my, I guess like legally it means sort of next in line to the CEO, but what it what it practically means for me is I'm part of Slush's five person leadership team. So we have a CEO, we have me, we have a COO that's operations, we have a CMO that's marketing, and a CFO that's, that's finances. And the part of Slush that I lead is our core stakeholders and our content. So if we start on the content side, I lead our program team, whose primary responsibility is to bring uh, you know, 160 speakers to Slush in, in Helsinki. Um, after last year, our program team has also taken over a, a something of a digital role. So they also source speakers for a digital event happening on the Node by Slush platform, which I think we can speak more about later. Um, and then the other team in the in the sort of under the content umbrella is Soaked by Slush, which is a team working on our nascent uh, sort of startup media, Soaked by Slush, which takes two forms. It's a, it's a long form sort of European startup media, uh, and then it's a podcast. Um, so that's the content side. On the sort of core stakeholder side, uh, of course, Slush, um, you know, was originally built and, and, and continues today to, uh, you know, at its core, live in the inter intersection between startups and investors. Um, and, and so we have two teams for that. We have a startups team, we have an investors team, and those teams both sort of, um, they, you know, conceptualize everything that we do specifically for towards those groups. They build our uh, networks and relationships in those sort of cohorts. Um, so, so those are two other, other teams that I, that I also lead. Um, on the side, I have uh, something of a responsibility of our research efforts. Uh, as well as our international expansion, but uh, the last uh, one has been on hold for the past one and a half years, so not too much to, to practically do there. And actually, Kevin, before we move on, I just wanted to get back to something you said earlier about, like, um, you know, you might imagine the president of Slush, like, being sort of whatever, whatever, super, super experienced. I think the cool thing about Slush specifically and the startup ecosystem more broadly, I think, it, is that, you know, they've proven that really young people without much experience who are super committed and thoughtful about the way they do their work can actually you know perform on par if not better than people with like tons of industry experience because that's the whole thing that like startups through proved is possible right like young people people in their 20 somethings go about disrupting sort of billion dollar industries against like incumbents the size of google or amazon so that's something that i think is really cool and I think that that's something that's, uh, you know, carried over from the like broader startup ecosystem to the way Slush uh, gives responsibility as, as, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with the last point that I just made now. I think gone are the days when, you know, companies are looking for 10 years plus experience and all those ki ki kind of stuff. Now it's more or less how committed and how passionate are you about what you are about to build or the road that you want get, to get into. Because literally anyone can learn anything on the job, basically, and, you know, get better at it. So, so in that sense, I see like slush pioneering this because if, 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 even with the, the volunteering experience, I volunteered in slush like twice already. I remember my first time volunteering in slush, I was, I was like less than six months old in Finland. I just moved from Ghana. So imagine like, no experience, understand nothing about the startup ecosystem and all of that. But Slush was still able to, you know, get me on board to join the team and, and work. So, so in that sense, it gave me a lot of leverage to, you know, act on my passion and my commitment. And it was one of the, like, rewarding volunteering experience that I've ever, ever had. So kudos to Slush for pioneering that. And I hope most other startups and companies will scrap all this five plus, 10 years plus experience to get a job because... I don't know. Have you been working for the rest of your life? Would you want to keep it in that direction? Why not get like fresh mind and stuff like that? No, okay. I fully agree. And actually, one point that I just wanted to make quickly there is it's it's really inspiring to hear your personal slush story as well, because I think that's something where slush can play a big causal role is for people who have sort of recently moved into Finland uh, or who are from abroad and you know interested in the in the Nordics or Finland specifically. Uh, like because if you look at sort of uh, you know 
if you look at rankings of European countries and how like hospitable they are to, to immigrants, like the Nordics are great place, places to live, but for example, just by virtue of the languages being so difficult, uh, the, you know, the Nordics don't always rank very highly in, in how easy it is come, to come here and, and sort of make a life. And, um, you know, at, at our last slush in, in, in 2019, half of our volunteer base was from abroad. So people were not Finnish citizens. I mean, they may be living in Finland, but, but weren't Finnish citizens. So that's actually a, 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 a part of it that I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud of. And it's super here to hear your personal story, which, you know, kind of validates that. Yeah, nice, nice. That's, that's for, for me, that's like very, very, very important. The inclusiveness, regardless of where you're coming from and what you know. Because at the end of the day, there are trainings and, and stuff like that, which helped us get into the role and deliver. Okay, so uh, it's been almost two years now with COVID and you know no fiscal events and no slush. What have you and your team been up to during this COVID period? It's a, it's a great. And let's, you know, when I look back at the past 18 months or whatever it's been, it feels like a much longer time than that. But uh, yeah, maybe the, the best way to tell is, is through a bit of a story as to, as to what has happened since like January 2020. So basically in, in January 2020, the Slush team came to work, uh, you know, 25 people, big team, expecting to recruit up to sort of, you know, grow to sort of 55 people pretty quickly and ready to organize a, a more than 20,000 person physical event, much like in, 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 in 2019. And uh, I think in February, we started getting the, the first signs of, of COVID becoming a real concern because we, we organized some events globally as well, uh, specifically one in China. And the uh, Chinese team, uh, somewhere around January to February, you know, called in. At that point, China had been placed in sort of total lockdown. They were all at home and, uh, you know, all of their plans for the year had been revamped. So I think that was the first realization that, hey, this, is a, this could become a, a real concern. And uh, then I remember we were all, I think it was mid-March or so, we were all sitting at the, maybe late March, we were all sitting at the office uh, watching the, the Finnish government sort of, uh, uh, sort of COVID, uh, sort of this sort of COVID information forum event type of thing. And, uh, and that's when the, the first event restrictions were announced. And I, I think that's when we realized that, uh, you know, this is going to be a, be a huge issue. But even at that point, like our event was what, eight months away or something like that. It was scheduled for late November. So I don't think many people on the team intuitively thought that this could be something that has a lasting impact so far into the future. So I think the immediate reaction that I had was like, okay, so, you know, maybe we need to delay the opening of our ticket sales. Like it, it was very focused on these like micro level problems. Uh, and it took a while for us, I think, a couple of weeks to realize like that this is a, a real macro level problem. It actually puts our, our big event in, in, in jeopardy. And eventually the result of that thought process was, uh, was for us to cancel our event as, as I think one of the first big event organizers. So we canceled in, in, early, uh, sorry, in early April of, of last year. Um, and, and of course there were unfortunate sort of side effects of that. One was the fact that we had to lay off a lot of people and so on. So, so it, was a, it was a very difficult time. I think what ensued after that is, uh, you know, suddenly we're in a position where, uh, you know, our, our, like our core product, what we've been building for the past 10 years is gone. Uh, you know, more than 95% of our revenue base is gone and we're left with like 14 people figuring out what to do. And, and for the first two or three months, you know, we thought very hard about like, what is the essence of slush? What will the uh, digital world that we'll enter for the, for the next sort of you know, foreseeable future, what will it look like? And what is the sort of space that slush could carve out, uh, carve out within it? And also, I think another thing we did during those two, th two to three first months, because we, for the first time, uh, we actually had a lot of time on our hands, like organizing slush is normally incredibly hectic. And, and so for the first time we actually had a lot of time is we did these sort of housekeeping projects, you know, um, internal projects that we've, we've, we've held off for long and, and so on. But, but, but anyway, more to the point, I think what came out of that uh, sort of deliberation process um, last year was a, a decision not to take our, our event virtual, uh, which is what most of the big tech conferences in Europe did, but to instead try and build a wholly separate, unique software product uh, that, would, that we would uh, run over the course of the fall. And I think that decision was just based on the realization that the slush event has become something so humongous and in its, is in its essence, something so complex 
and something that's so based on like the serendipitous effect of like people bumping into each other in, in, in our events hallways, that that cannot be replicated in the online world. And yeah, I think we set ourselves up for a very steep climb by not doing an event, but I do think that that hypothesis is held true. We could not have organized an event that would have, uh, you know, would have been worthy of the slush brand uh, last fall. So what we instead did is we uh, built a software product called Node by Slush, which was a uh, startup community uh, hosted on an online platform uh, for startups, investors, and what we call ecosystem builders. So it's slightly more narrow part of the whole Slush community, a slightly more focused part. Um, and, and then that community gathered over the course of, the, of last fall for three consecutive uh, online events, what we call community events. And those events were very much based on gatherings like this one here. So small gatherings of 10 to 50 people, uh, uh, typically curated gatherings uh, around a curated topic. So say, you know, the best expert on Series A fundraising coming in to speak to 30 founders who are next going to raise their Series A. They were also super interactive. So we, we hosted them on Zoom. Uh, people were always able to ask questions out loud on the call from, from some pretty cool mentors and so on. So really trying to build, bring as much of, uh, of this sort of community feel uh, into, the, into the sessions we run. And uh, yeah, that's what we did for the, the better part of last fall. It was uh, rather chaotic because the social organization is not built to uh, build like software as a service products. It is also not built to run online events on a monthly basis. It is, it is built for a very specific thing, which is to organize a huge event once a year. Uh, so I think we learned a lot. And I think the interesting part was that um, uh, I don't think most people at Slush at their core are people who get excited about organizing events like events are great but they're only a platform for enacting a certain kind of change in the world and that change is you know solving the world's hardest problems through young companies so that's i think what everyone who's employed by slash gets excited about like at its core and it was super interesting and learning experience to take that same mission and uh and try and solve it through a new kind of uh, you know online platform rather than the physical event so the problem was interesting um the way we went about that problem was probably chaotic and, and we learned something in the process. And I think most importantly, we managed to engage with some of the hold up to slash's financial position and just put our put ourselves in a position where, you know, in 2021, when we thought we're gonna go back to organizing a physical event, people still remember us and uh and and you know we're in a position to take the huge risk, uh like as in financial risk that is organizing a, a big event. And honestly, from the January of 2021. We've held on to a couple of the products that we developed last year. We still run Node by Slush. We still run monthly community events, but it's become even more focused. Now it's really a founder community, founder to founder community. Uh, and also we've uh, continued investing in our media product, which I mentioned, Shop by Slush. But apart from that, uh, you know, we've been laser focused on figuring out how we can organize a physical event this December, which, uh, you know, at this point, it looks like we're definitely going to be able to do. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that, that later. So that was a bit of a story. There were something you want to laser focus on? You can ask a uh, follow-up question. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That was really interesting story to see like, curve, you know, what has happened within these past years in a, in a summary. So you made me mention of soaked by slush that I've been following for the past couple of months. Actually, we, we, we do share posts from that, uh, from that platform onto our audience because there are a lot of learnings and a lot of uh, insight from both founders and investors and the community builders. So like really great job with so by, 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 by slush. But my question around that would be like, at the moment, I, I know that it's like a, a free platform where you can just come and read updates about you know, founders, investments and stuff like that. Do you have like some plans or that for, for example, to also help to add more revenue stream to slush? Actually, so by Slush is monetized. It's just not monetized from the, the user point of view. And, and that's a pretty typical media business model, right? Like a lot of media are, are free to read, uh, but then they're monetized in, in other ways. And that's actually a commitment back when we launched Soaked in uh, November of 2019 for the first time. Uh, that was a commitment that we made to our communities that Soaked will be, I think the line went something like, always free, never boring, surprising at times. So we, we made a commitment that it's going to be free forever for the end user. However, we do have a, a leap. I think what what looks or like we have an early version of a monetization model for it, which is to sell uh, basically spots in the media. So to selected partners 
who would anyway qualify to produce content for Soaked and who can produce something that is genuinely valuable for the community, we allow them to basically purchase a spot and, and, and produce some media, uh, produce some content. And, and obviously we make that obvious. So, so you know, it's a sponsored if, uh, if a post is sponsored and so on. So that's the way, that's the, the first try that we've, uh, that we've made at uh, creating a, a monetization model for media. But it's, it's difficult, right? Like, uh, I don't think any macro indicator suggests that you should found a media in, in 2019 or, or 2021. Um, because you know the incumbents, uh, many of them are, 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 are tanking. So uh, yeah, so it's, it's it's difficult, and I think that my answer may be quite difficult, uh, say a year from now or even a couple of months from now. Uh, it's very much a an experiment that we're we're running. Awesome, awesome. Questions from the audience, but uh, I have just one last question about the past, because now we've been talking about the past, you know, past years and all of that. Before we move into Slush 2021, what we have in mind for the future and how it's, go it's go going to be. We'll take the questions from the audience, then we'll go over to Slush 2021 and how it's going to be. So uh, my last question will be about Node, Node by Slush. I saw the ad and uh, the content and looked very very exciting and it came at the will i say at the right moment where everybody was like oh we need to go out we need to engage with people in, interact but unfortunately we can't do that because of covid the note by slush came uh like if you can shed a bit of light on like uh, what, what what's this platform all 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 about is it like a, a free platform or is it pay is it only for founders or is it both for entrepreneurs and is this something that is currently running or it's just focused on this community event that you mentioned? Like, what's like a few? Can you give us like a sneak peek into Node by Slush, you know? Again, there, um, uh, it's been, Node has been a, a continuous experiment. So actually the answer last September is fully different from the answer uh, in September of this year. Uh, but I can share a bit of the, the storyline there. So Node kicked off last year as this, um, sort of pretty extensive platform for, as I said, startups, investors, and ecosystem builders, uh, which was paid. So you paid up front to be able to join the platform. Once you were on the platform, you had access to features like forum, uh, like sort of these Q and A sessions in writing with uh, with sort of founders and investors and, and, and operators, uh, to a directory of the other people and companies on the platform, sort of chat functionalities to reach out to them, and uh, some content as well, like some some written content. And then once you had purchased access to the platform, you got access to yeah all of those things plus a monthly community event. However, over the course of the la of, of last fall, we um, we learned quite a lot about the product, and we learned that the one thing that really stuck with people, for one reason or another, were the events. Like they were the only part of the Node by Slash platform that people really truly really loved and came back to. So in, 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 I think, January, February of this year, we made a decision, uh, as I think any sort of, you know, company building a nascent product is, should do, to, to focus on what's truly essential, which is the, the community events. And uh, what we've done since is uh, we moved on to a new, much simpler, uh, custom-made platform that is built in-house. And right now, what Node looks like is uh, it's free to join for any startup founder. Uh, or operator. Uh, once you're on the platform, you get uh, access to a curated list of the best resources on the startup ecosystem. So there's some past slash stage talks, there's some past no talks, and then there's a, a sort of a repository of, of third party content as well. So basically these operational resources on various aspects of building a company, whether it's, you know, putting together your founding team, whether it's uh, sort of running marketing before you have a marketeer, whether it's, uh, you know, expanding internationally later on during your journey. So these super operational topics are covered. And then you also get access again to these monthly community events, which is where the community comes together. And, and during those, we host uh, a couple of different sessions. We host startup investor matchmaking sprints. So these strings of meetings between startups and investors. We host uh, uh, what we call mentoring sessions, which are these 30 to 50 person uh, super hands-on interactive sessions with uh, some, some speakers that we bring on. Uh, then we host something, like, something called investor workshops, which are basically VC office hours gone virtual. So a VC fund like an Excel or an index might come in and, and do this monthly event. And again, sort of 30 to 50 founders can join. So there's this sort of selection of session formats that we found to really strike, strike a chord with early stage founders when we tried out many more things uh, last fall. 
And actually, right now, we're in the process of building out a separate layer to Node by Slush, which will be an investor deal flow tool. So basically, when you join Slush as a startup founder, you get asked sort of 40 to 50 questions on your company. So it's actually it's a pretty heavy application. And uh, later on, we'll, uh, this fall, actually, we'll launch the beta of an investor deal flow tool that looks at all that data. So a VC fund can, can come in and, and look at all the data that startups have submitted. And what we're really betting on there, because there are great deal flow tools uh, out there, there's DealRoom, there's PitchBook, there's Traction, there's Crunchbase, uh, and, and many more. We're really betting on the value of self-submitted data. So when startups themselves get to describe what their growth is going to look like in the next 12 or 18 months, they get to describe what the strengths of their team are, that that is, you know, proprietary data that, uh, you know, has a unique value and, 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 and that will be sort of our, 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 our value pocket. But again, we're launching the beta soon. Let's see if that hypothesis is true. Maybe it's not. Maybe, you know, again, the answer is different in six months. And if so, that's fine. We learned something. So yeah, I think the essential part and, and perhaps the part that, you know, someone in the audience could try and mimic is to just really... Uh, you know, try different things uh, in the spirit of rapid iteration and move away from things that don't work and double down on the ones that work. And right now it's events for us and that's what Node has become. And I said, they're free. That sounds very typical, like a startup, you know, iterated and experimented. Would you say that Slush is a startup? <laughs> Would you consider Slush to be a startup with the way you guys operate and work? Yeah, it depends on if you take a strict view of what a startup is, like uh, an externally funded, uh, usually externally funded young company building its own sort of scalable product um, in on the lookout for expand uh, like uh, explosive growth. Then Slush is not a startup. Slush is an established company. No VC fund would invest in us. We're not that kind of business model. We're not for profit, so that doesn't help either. But uh, I would like to think that in the Slush ethos and way of doing things, we've copied some of the best ways of of, uh, of uh, how startups run things. Maybe that's my answer. <laughs> awesome, that's nice. Okay, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have a question from Maria. She's asking, how does the Slush team organize the side events? So first, are there even go going to be side events in Slush this year? Then yeah. how, how does Slush organize all of these side events? Very good. Okay, so I guess we're in slush 2021 territory now. So the, the upcoming event on December 1st and 2nd. And, and it's true. Um, over the past years, over the past 10 years, really, um, slush has a week of hundreds of events organized all around Helsinki and the, the wider metropolitan area. Um, and the answer there is, is twofold. One, uh, the Slush team organized a selected set of, uh, of its own side events. So we have things like Founders Day, which is uh, for all the startup founders joining Slush. That'll happen this year. We have Investor Day, which is uh, an exclusive day, a day uh, on the day before Slush for all the investors joining. We have Media Day, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a couple, uh, maybe five, that the Slush team itself organizes. But then all the rest, all the side events, whether those are so-called sort of slush official side events, which uh, enjoy the sort of official stature, whether they're, uh, you know, the dozens of uh, venture capital fund hosted dinners that happen around Helsinki, whether it's morning yoga in Espanadi Park, uh, that's, a whole, that's all organized by, by third parties. Some of them are our partners, so they're like monetarily affiliated with us. They, they pay us and we support them. But most are honestly just people and entities who are in Helsinki, want to organize something on their terms for their own group of people. And, and you know, uh, and, and uh, yeah, so that's how we managed to organize hundreds of events uh, by, by letting others do it, basically. Awesome. Thanks for that answer. Uh, we have another question from Mark. I hope I pronounced it correctly. We are a young team premiers from Barcelona, living now in Helsinki for six weeks. What do you recommend us to go visit in terms of the entrepreneurship area? Right. So as in how to get into the, uh, uh, what to visit to, to get, a, get a feel for the Helsinki startup ecosystem. I, I guess that's the, the question. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, I guess so. By the way, Kelvin, you're going to have, have to answer this one as well, because it's, it's, uh, <laughs> this is your turf as well. Um, yeah, I think um, Helsinki is a really small place, so there aren't too many places where much of the community gathers. And I think the, probably the hotspot these days is, is Maria Zero One, which I'm sure you're aware of, this um, uh, startup campus right in, in downtown Helsinki in, in Kampi. Obviously, there's tons of startup and VC offices there. Um, during COVID, they've been on pause, but in, in normal times, there's uh, quite a lot of events and, and parties that are open uh, to sort of everyone interested. So I think at Maria, you will find no end of, of, of like-minded people. 
Then I think uh, Startup Sauna, so that's the, the birthplace of Slush as well as Alto ES in, in Otaniem, in Espo, is, uh, you know, probably was this a little more once upon a time, but, but still is a, a place where the, uh, where I think the really early stage entrepreneurial ecosystem gathers, like students who are still, uh, you know, waiting for their chance to become founders. Uh, there's some really early stage startup offices. There's a lot of these great ecosystem projects like Alto is itself. Uh, there's Junction, the hackathon, there's Key was the accelerator. Uh, there's Startup Life First, uh, the sort of, you know, job placement in San Francisco type of service, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's certainly, uh, certainly another place uh, to visit. Um, in terms of events, uh, bigger events, I would say come to Slush. Uh, that's a good event. Uh, Arctic 15 uh, is another really good event, typically hosted uh, in, in sort of late spring, early early summer. Um, that's uh, a similar event to Slush, but a little more focused. Um, so yeah, those are some of my, my tidbits. Maybe you knew all of those already. Kelvin, what's your take? Maybe you can add on to the list. Yeah, I think you, you pretty much did justice to the list because Helsinki, it's not that's big, you know, in terms of activities and engagement, but we have like co a couple of key ecosystem pl players who help to keep it very, very active. For example, you mentioned Maria Zero One is like, you know, like the campus for startups. So basically if anyone is visiting Helsinki and you feel like you want to get the feel of what is happening in Helsinki startup ecosystem, most times they organize some events like, you know, founders uh, events or entrepreneurs events or startup start start events where you can get to interact with uh, other startups there and uh yeah if you are looking to just you know work or get some stuff done there are stuff like you know team company where they provide even like a free workspace for other other entrepreneurs so if if, if you don't feel like doing all the work a, a, alone or in a hotel or in your accommodation you can just come out and uh, work together with some other people, which gives you room to have more interaction with them. And uh, like you mentioned, startup sauna, where everything was giving bed to. <laughs> Kiwas were giving bed to, Slush was giving bed to. Everything literally uh, in Helsinki came out of there. So even uh, in a grid, there are a lot of like startups, we can just randomly pop into and you know talk and get to understand what they're doing. But most times you get to, uh, join some of this community through their events online. So basically now I believe that most of them are having fiscal events. So you just check online what are the most uh, like uh, the events that are happening at the moment and which of them are physical, which will give you access to some of these communities. And when you meet the members, you're able to somehow, you know, engage with them and, you know, know about what they're doing. Then there's also Shortcuts, which has a lot of workshops and trainings and uh, events focus around entrepreneurship and uh, a bit of startups. So you have a lot of lists already. So go make do with this one. Then if you need more, we can talk about it later. Just send us a message afterwards. Absolutely. Okay. Kevin, I have a, one follow-up question for you. Um, uh, obviously, the world is no longer only about physical places where to meet. So on top of Startup Grind, what are the best digital or, or virtual communities uh, in, the, in the Helsinki ecosystem? That's a very good question. So uh, before now, uh, I'm not sure if they're having anything online. There's health, health, health tech. So it's it's more or less like a startup grind with all these fireside charts, inviting a lot of experienced speakers to come and uh, you know, share, share their experience in a particular field. Then there's also Start Helsinki. Start Helsinki is more of an entrepreneurship. And they constantly have like a lot of events, both online and offline. So in uh, in uh, like uh, adding to startup grind and all of our events and acti activities in Helsinki, you can also get engaged with all this health tech. You know, uh, start Helsinki. Uh, there's even startup weekend. There's even founders institute, which most times organize some sort of pitching competition and pitching if, if, if events. And uh, if you happen to come in the period where Kiwas is having either a barbecue or an outdoor event, you should definitely go for it because there you meet shitloads of people who are probably going to, you know, help you in whatever that you are doing. That was a super answer. I think you, you covered that. So there's some resources to, to, to visit. I think that should take you a few weeks to, to visit all of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, cool. We'll come back to the questions from the audience uh, before the end of the fireside chat. I'll just move, move ahead with uh, the one we have on our list. So now we are going into Slush 2021 and uh, more like the future. Uh, Biko, how do you feel about Slush 2021 in terms of, I don't know, 
what what are those things that that you feel the feelings uh, the emotions after not being able to organize it last year and now it's going to happen and you know how does it feel like good question so i think the basic feeling like the, the core feeling uh of, of organizing any event any any bigger event certainly is you work you know incredibly hard for an incredibly long time and then it all materializes within a couple of days at the very end of the process. So even in a normal year, that feeling is super, super strong, that anticipation. I remember from 2019, uh, I, I started then in, in March, so I didn't experience quite the full year, but still a good eight or nine months of work towards the event. And remember, it was you know 10 or 1 a.m. Uh, November 21st uh, in front of founder stage uh, during the opening show of Slush when you know the the sort of because because none of the team had, had seen like the, the opening show that we start Slush with so so it was all a surprise to me as well like you know the bass went off and the the lasers came out and so on and I like literally physically started to cry because it felt so rewarding like such a like a, an outpour of, of emotions when you work so long towards something that then materializes so quickly. Uh, I think this year, having not been able to organize the event last year, uh, even though we did other great things, nothing compares to the uh, the feeling that is, you know, the, the sort of bussing laser lit conference hall that you've sort of helped to build. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm more anticipant than ever. Uh, I think that that feeling hopefully is there with our, our audience as well. I think in all the conversations I've had over the, over the past year, especially, if not the past 18, 18 months, people have been telling us how, how they long for physical events. Like, even though there are, there are great virtual events out there, we've seen an emergence of good platforms for organizing virtual events, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's Hopin or Around the World or, or, or even Zoom. Um, but uh, I think what people feel is, you know, no, uh, sorry, no online event has managed to crack the sort of possibility for serendipitous value that happens when you gather, you know, whether it's 8,000 or 20,000 people into one room and, and make them talk to each other. And then I think secondly, um, you know, no physical platform still feels as humane as, as physical interaction at an event. Uh, you know, wh whatever the format, whatever the session, how however well it's done, we're still curbed by, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the screen in between us and, and whoever we're talking to. So I think the feeling is there on the on the audience side as well. And, you know, as an organizer, I'm just incredibly excited to be able to, you know, do what we do best as Slush, do what, you know, 10 years of work have gone into sort of creating systems for. See all the work. So our whole team, uh, and you know, close to the event, you know, um, over a thousand volunteers. Like I'm, I'm just looking forward to that all coming to life in this very physical manifestations. You know, one euphoric week uh, around Helsinki, and then I think on top of that, because actually, uh, funnily enough, I've I've only done an external role at Slush uh, during COVID, so I've spoken to hundreds of people over the past year and a half. And I've, you know, never met one of them physically. So I feel like there are hundreds of people that I know around the world who I've never met, which is interesting. Uh, but now, you know, the vast majority of them will be coming to Helsinki. So I feel like it will be a, a weird but, but, but deeply and emotionally rewarding experience to, to get to meet to those of people. So I don't know, to sum that all up, I don't know what the, the word for that emotion is. I guess it's, uh, you know, thrilled, excited. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. I think we are all excited to see Slush back because even for me personally, Slush has been one of those. It's like it, it happens during the dark, the darkest and the coldest period, but it brings it brings its own energy. You know, it brings its own vibe. People don't even re re realize that it's cold or that it's dark. All they know is that, oh, Slush is happening. You know, all road leads to Slush. Let's go meet people, network and have a good time. Then when slush is over, they will realize, oh damn it, we're in Finland. It's fucking cold and dark, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm quite sad that, that I'm not gonna be in Finland uh, this uh, by December to attend slush. But uh, I just wish you guys all the best in the plan. I'll I'll miss a lot, but it's fine. I'm gonna be here next year. Uh, so I have three in one question for you. Okay, in terms of expectation, what should startups, entrepreneurs, and investors expect from slush this year? What what is gonna be different in that sense? 
Yeah, very good. Maybe we sort of should have started this section with this question, actually. But but here we go. So you know, let me tell what, what's happening. Um, yeah. So I think the uh, the biggest change, the one that you can't fail to notice, is the fact that Slush this year will be uh, quite a lot smaller in size. So you know, having had to organize an event in the midst of this sort of perennial, pretty significant uncertainty, uh, we one of the first ways in which we reacted to that uncertainty was to reduce the size of the event. So the 2019 event was somewhere between 20 and 25 thousand people. And now we're going for 8,000 people. So that's one third of the size of the, the 2019 event. So that's obviously significantly smaller. However, I think if you're a, a person in those groups that you mentioned, so a startup founder, a startup operator, an investor, um, you'll, be, you'll be happy to know that that reduction has been done mainly by really laser focusing this year's slush on those who are at the core of what we're trying to do. So uh, whereas in, in 2019, something like 35% of, of everyone in slush uh, was a startup uh, or investor, now it's going to be more like 55 or 60%. So it's a hyper-focused slush. Uh, the, that percentage is higher than at any previous event. Um, and you know while we've had to do this reduction because of COVID, I think I'm actually quite excited excited to see what will happen when you know every single bump in again is that much like that much more likely to be that uh, sort of valuable co connection between between two people who really need to meet, meet each other so that's the like the headline change from 25,000 to 8,000 now i think i another change that is implied by the fact that we have a more focused slush is uh is that you'll see small changes uh, across basically the the whole fabric of the of the event so on our stages uh, you won't see anything but hyper concrete startup and investor focused uh, program. Uh, you, you will only see speakers who have been measured by like the predominant metric of like what of value can they bring to the early stage startups in the audience. So you'll see, you know, hyper focused startup content uh, happening across two main stages and in, in two smaller studios as well. You'll also find a concept called Builder Studio, which is a fully new stage concept for this year, which is this, uh, yeah, it's a two day stage over the course of the, the full event, where in 30, 30 minute sessions, we unpack uh, the steps to building a great company. So we go from the early days from, again, you know, creating your founding team or, you know, build, measure, learn, or finding product market fit, all the way to the last topic being about exits, you know, do you IPO, do you sell your company and so on. And in between we go through, uh, you know, 30 different operational topics that are core to creating a great company. So I think you'll just find that everything has been done a little bit more with you, a startup founder, a startup operator and investor in, in, in mind. I think beyond that, uh, the slush week and the, the fabric of the event will look rather similar. So it's still a two-day event. On the day before the event, we'll host our own side events that I alluded to, Founders Day, Investor Day, which if you are in, in these two groups, you'll, you'll get to attend. Um, there will still be a full week of program happening around Helsinki, and I, I still think the, the city will be bussing with uh, the slush, slush vibe. Uh, equally, uh, the slush event will still be dark. It'll still be lit by lasers. It'll still be high production value. Uh, you know, it should still feel like this immersive, uh, almost Burning Man like experience when when you come there. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's all in place. I think the the last thing that has actually changed is uh, over the past two years. Um, I think uh, like sort of within our team here in Helsinki, I think our understanding and take on the kind of uh, sort of entrepreneurship that we want to be furthering has matured and, and, and changed quite a lot. So so obviously back in you know 2011, if we start there, when Slush was founded, it was founded as a movement to create entrepreneurship in, in Finland. It didn't much care about what that entrepreneurship did or, or what it was like. We just wanted to create an ecosystem here because one did not exist. And I, I think over the past 10 years, Finland has provenly built out a startup system. I think over the next 10 years, and spurred by the sort of first generation of success companies like or, or, of like success stories like Supercell or, or, or Rovio much earlier, or now more, more recently sort of Bolt or Swapi or Ivan or Ora or Barrio, like spurred by all of the people who will take their capital and learnings from those companies and go on to do something new. We really hope that the next 10 years will be about taking all this power for change and solving the world's hardest problems. So we call it an entrepreneurial renaissance, and it's our theme for Slash 2021. And it's actually like, we'll, we're, we're, it's going to be this, um, like, we're going to interlace like uh, the, the actual renaissance. So the one that happened in the, the 14 or 1500s. Uh, so like cloisters and, and you know, all of these uh, sort of uh, themes from, from, you know, middle age or late middle age renaissance Europe with, um, 
with sort of more recent, huge technological advancement. So it will be very obvious at the event that our theme is entrepreneurial renaissance. Mm -hmm. But what entrepreneurial renaissance means to us is that we need to change entrepreneurship in three different ways. The first one of them is diversity and inclusion. It's not okay that 90% of European venture funding goes to all male teams. It's not okay that looking at whatever metric of, of diversity, whether it's uh, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic background, educational background, or like the list goes on. Uh, if you represent the uh, the underrepresented sort of cohort, you are more likely to, to, to report that you find it difficult to, to find a place in the ecosystem. You're more likely to report that you may have been sort of harassed or discriminated against. Like none of those things are fine. They're not fine on a on a hu humane and like equality level, but they also don't make sense from like an efficiency point of view because it's clear that if we only have like white young white uh, university educated males, uh, you know, innovating in the startup ecosystem, they will solve problems that they themselves face. They will solve problems for other white young university educated men. And you know, believe it or not, not everyone in the world is 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 of that group. Not everyone in the world looks like me, basically. Uh, so just to to uh, increase the problem set that entrepreneurship can grapple with, we need the full extent of human heterogeneity to represent it in who is actually building us. That's the first one, diversity and inclusion. And I'll, I'll speed up a little bit so as not to bore you. The second axis of change is what we call true progress. So that's all about the next generation of entrepreneurs uh, getting excited about solving the really hard problems out there. Because there are big problems to solve, right? Like over the next 10 years, we have to do something uh, that turns the course of climate change or the, uh, the, the sort of consequences will be fatal. Uh, we've just come out of a pandemic and, uh, you know, everyone who, who knows something about this topic, uh, you know, says that there is a causal link between uh, between the sort of um, the disappearance of, uh, of, of, of sort of, uh, of natural ecosystems, of them coming closer to urban environments, between that and, and pandemics. So that's another one. We, we really don't want to be uh, go through another pandemic like this one in the, in the next few years. Um, there's still massive, uh, massive amounts of hunger in the developing world. So whatever your the problem may be, you know, those are the types of issues that we want startup founders to get excited about solving. So that's true progress. And then the last uh, sort of axis or tenet of the theme is what we call innovation reborn. And it's all about returning the, the startup ecosystem a little bit towards its like Silicon Valley roots from the 60s and 70s. Because like, as the name says, in Silicon Valley in 60s and 70s, startups were building semiconductors based on silicon, the, the, uh, the uh, you know, element. Um, and, and, and by definition, then, they were people who were building new technologies, like who were reimagining tomorrow, who were creating something that before they started creating it did not exist. And I think ever since the sort of dot com boom of the of the late nineties, uh, and when you know when tech has sort of become this digital exercise, more and more companies are not creating new technologies; they're applying existing technologies across. And you know. Companies. But, you know, could we be a little bit more ambitious than that? Could we have companies that try and get us to Mars? Could we have more companies like Lilium that's trying to build like these, you know, uh, medium range jets that are going to fly like between 20 and 300 kilometers between cities? Could we have more companies that are building, um, you know, that are building sustainable batteries like Northvolt? I mean, the list goes on, but can we be a little bit more ambition in the way we create new technologies in the ecosystem? So just to wrap it all up, I think you'll see that theme very visibly re represented on our stages this year. You'll or sorry, at our event this year. You'll see it in the event design, you'll see it in who is on stage, what those who are on stage talk about. Uh, and I hope that that's going to be the feeling and the sort of, uh, sort of the, the empowered state in which you will leave slash 2021. Uh, you know, you will leave ready to, to actually go out and, and, and solve some really difficult problems. So it was a long answer, but those are the things that are, have changed and, and, and that have not about slash 2020. That 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 makes slush into an even more exciting. You know, the way you you pictured it, the way you explained it, I think if anyone was never thinking of going to slush, this is like a very good answer to get them on board. Because what you just explained now is super like very, very powerful. And uh the way I see it, it of course it's gonna take a lot of uh, implementation and planning to ensure that this is seen across all the side events on the stage and everything but this this gives me like really really hope like gives me hope you know because at at, at some point what we we realize with some of the events and companies are like they become norm you know okay we organize events every year and that's it you know but seeing the way you explain slush and how you are more like challenging the norm you know we don't want to settle 
what more can we do? Of course, there are already existing technologies and stuff, but can we do so something more? Can we go out of the box? Can we challenge the status quo? And can we, you know, somehow help the, the economy, the ecosystem, uh, and ev everything in that sense? So that was like really great answer, even though it was long, but it made a lot of a lot of sense. Which brings me to my next question: Your dream or your your vision? It's it's freaking big. It's huge. It's I'm like, how 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 are you gonna how are you gonna ensure the implementation of this across everything that happens in Slush? And you know, are you hundred percent ready, or are you still in the planning and preparation stage? More like two in one question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess there's there's two questions in there. Um. I think on the on the first point, I, I don't think I can give any sort of super surprising or specific answer. I think in any organization, there exists values and there exists a, a reason for being what you may call a, a mission or vision. And, uh, you know, it's any organization's job to make sure that uh, as a new employee joins, they are you know told what those things are. And then as they continue working for the company, um, that they you know really live true to, to those types of those types of values and the, the mission and vision. And I think Slush is no different. Like, yes, we have a, a big mission uh, and we have a pretty big vision as well. Uh, but uh, I think our, you know, the primary way of doing that is just get, getting everyone on the slush team, you know, first the full-time team working, you know, the sort of the paid employees, later on all the volunteers, equally all of our subcontractors, our production company Sun Effects, and, and all the, the, the sort of cluster of, of companies that uh, help produce Slush 2021, get all of those to understand what it is we're truly trying to do. And when you do that well, I think it, uh, you know, it pays dividends as well. Because it's much more inspiring to organize an event that uh, you know that tries to solve climate change over the next ten years. I mean, that's that's a bit naive, but like uh, that tries to at least push us in that direction than to organize an event just for the sake of organizing events. You know, people like doing things uh, the meaning of which they understand, and that meaning, you know, the bigger it is, as long as it feels realistic, and and you know, I hope our, our meaning feels realistic. Um, I think I think it's powerful and brings meaning to, to people's jobs, and, and I think that's increasing. Yeah, people wanna wanna work. Um, to your second question, which was more about like the, the planning phase of Slush, where we, where we are, um, we're in a pretty good position. So I think um, the biggest hurdles that we've had to overcome over the course of this year is the uh, you know perennial continuous uncertainty about uh, about COVID. Uh, and in parts, it's been natural. Obviously, COVID in Finland and across the world has gone in waves. In parts, it's maybe been exasperated by um, fairly short, like regulation that's done in fairly short cycles and, and very very little foresight into into what the sort of uh, you know regulatory environment that we're going to face in, in December is going to be. So, so this bit natural and maybe sort of cost parts to it. Um, but now that uh, we're actually on the other side of that, now that uh, actually I think it's uh, the day after tomorrow, you know, restrictions in the, in the Helsinki area are going to be lifted. It's again fine to organize events without restrictions. Now what we're left with is an 8,000 person event. And that's something we can do. That's something that this organization was designed to do. And it's actually something that's quite a bit smaller than we did, what we did last time we, we engaged in this. So, you know, organizing an 8,000 person event is not easy, but, uh, you know, once we're on the other side of COVID and we can forget about that, it's, it's something that this organization is able to do and uh, yeah to that point I think we're in a, in a pretty good position so <clears throat> we've actually sold out in a, in a couple of ticket categories uh, including attendee tickets um, you know if you're not a startup investor you can still buy a day two ticket but so, so we're actually sold out in some ticket categories and, and and close to selling out in many others so because of our reduced capacity we're actually sold will sell out way before the event so if you don't have your tickets buy them now because they'll they'll sell out um, I think in terms of speakers, we haven't launched all of them publicly, but uh, our stages are pretty much full. Um, you know, our partnerships pipeline, which is an important part of organizing event, looks looks very solid. Um, so yeah, I think uh, having gone through many uh, pretty difficult decisions over the course of this year and pretty risky decisions, now it's all starting to pay dividends and we're actually left with an event that we definitely can organize. So yeah, going, going pretty smoothly um, now, but it, you know, it did it uh, for, for all of this year. Awesome, awesome. I think you're already in a pretty good uh, situation. Like, seems like everything is figured out already and uh, we're in the right direction in terms of organizing this slush and making things, you know, go in line with what you have as a, as a vision. That's really, really good to know. Okay, we can take a couple of more questions from the audience. There seems to be a lot of them. Uh, so there's a question from Margarita. Are you planning to organize slush also in other countries than Finland? 
It's a, a super good question. I actually, <clears throat> I, I wish I knew the answer to this one because it's something that we're debating at the moment. Um, but uh, so as not to leave you there, um, Slush obviously from the very beginning was a global event and tried to become a global event. The way we did that at the very start in like 2012, 2013, 2014 was we just literally sent out people uh, in, in, like out into the the, the the big wide world to organize events under the Slush brand. And by that, I don't mean like big fancy conferences. I mean like 20 person dinner parties uh, just to get someone to attend and know about Slush. So that was the original way in which Slush uh, expanded and really the, the sort of um, prime years for, for that strategy were like 2013 and 2014. Um, out of that came a couple of uh, slush main events around the world. So we've organized main events in Tokyo, in uh, China, first in Beijing, later in Shanghai, and then in a, a couple of other cities as well, including Nanjing, um, and then in Singapore as well. And uh, some of those events run ran their course already before COVID. So Slush Singapore was discontinued after 2018. Um, and then Slush China and uh, and Slush Tokyo, obviously, um, you know, largely because of COVID, uh, have, have been on hold uh, for, for a while now. Um, as of now, we don't have a fully clear picture of what Slush's return to a global event is going to be or like a global phenomenon or web of events. Uh, in our 10-year goals, we state that by 2030, we want to uh, have 100 active communities uh, around the world on every single continent, including uh, Antarctica, so, so the South Pole, and we need to figure out a, a way to go, get there. And I think like the early hypothesis of how we're going to do that is, is the following. Um, I think we learned in between sort of 2015 and 2019 that uh, you know, coming from Helsinki and going to a, a, a place far away and organizing an event is, is incredibly difficult to do. And it's actually much easier and, and probably, you know, produces much better results to try and find local communities that want to organize events themselves on their own terms for their local community. And for such to support them with like brand and, and, and various other assets. And we actually tried out that model in, in 2019. Uh, we are trying that out again this year in a, in a weeks in a small Norwegian town called Trondheim, uh, Trondheim Slush. Uh, it's a bit like TEDx or, or Junction, Junction X and so on. And I think based on what we learned from, from Trondheim this year and probably from a couple of other pilots next year, uh, we're going to decide uh, how we're going to start scaling the slush concept uh, around the world. There's, there's plenty of inbound. I think I get like an email a week from someone saying that they want to organize slush somewhere. But it, uh, it's important to, I think, be sensible about that to, you know, nail one model of doing it first in like one or two or three places and only then try and scale to that 100 or, or whatever it's going to be. Um, with that being said, um, we still have a team in, in, in China going. Uh, it's possible that we do something there late this year, early next year, uh, actually like a slush trip. Right? But of course, the past 18 months have uh, put a stop to our international efforts and we kind of need to, uh, we need to reinvent ourselves there. So I hope that that's uh, an exhaustive answer of, of where we stand and, and how we plan to get, get back out there. Yeah, I think that was a very, very, very detailed answer. You gave more than what, what was expected. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have a couple of quick, quick questions around organizing events and uh, communication with guests in Slush. So we have one from Esther, which is your golden mistake organizing an event. I don't know why she tagged it golden, but you know. What was that? A, a what mistake? Which is your golden mistake? Organizing an event, like oh, okay, what okay. is the I don't know maybe the biggest mistake or like I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> oh, it's golden mistake, like the biggest thing, like your, like your what number one, don't do this type of thing. Or, or I would look at it in the sense that gold is not is very rare, so it's like what is that one mistake that if you fuck up, it's done, something <laughs> like that, I guess. Okay, interesting question. Never thought about this. Fuck ups. Uh, okay. <laughs> Fuck ups. Okay, it's big fuck ups. And I wonder if it's something that I, I, I should have done or or uh, something that I, I wouldn't want to do. Um, hmm, let me think about this. Um, so I think, okay, maybe this is our answer. Over the course of the, the slush years, over slush's growth, there have been a couple of moments when, uh, when this, uh, well, if things have happened slightly differently, slush would not be here today. I think the first one, 
was when Miki Kuusi, the first year of Slush, promised to organize Slush to uh, Petar Vestarbak, uh, the, the almighty eagle of Rovio, uh, and basically forgot about it. And uh, very late in the year, realized that he needs to do it. That, that was the first, so that's maybe not answering the question. In 2013, there was another of these near-death moments. That was the last year in which we organized an event in Kaapeli Tehdas, so the, the old cable factory in, in Ruohalahti in, in Helsinki. And uh, the issue with the cable factory was that it had slush had already outgrown that venue. So I think uh, the cable factory fits something like three and a half thousand people, and we brought on something like seven thousand. Uh, so it was just there were way too many people for the venue. Uh, there were many creative ideas for how to try and get around that. One was when the team called up uh, the CEO of Celia Line, which is this uh, ferry company that does these like Helsinki Stockholm cruises, and tried to get a an actual ferry like next to the venue because it, it sits by this canal, uh, the venue. Uh, eventually, it turned out that they they were not sure that that canal is deep enough for their their uh, ships, so they they didn't come. Uh, instead, we got like a couple of smaller boats. But then the, the biggest thing was um, there were these huge tent structures all around like Kaapeliteras, the cable factory. And like a couple of days before the event, there was uh, like there was torrential rain. Like the weather was as bad as it ever gets in Helsinki. And basically the whole this whole outdoor area became like uh, be, be, became like swamped and, and was not one in which he could have organized an event. And I think the uh, the eventual solution to that was number one, getting like all the like pump trucks. I don't know that that's the term, but like uh, these is trucks that you can use to pump water from the whole Helsinki area to pump water out of it. And then I think luckily the kind of sky cleared up a couple of days before the event, it was able to, to go ahead. But that was like a really close to near death experience for Slush, like only two days away from not being able to organize an event. And I think it would have bankrupted us. Um, I think the last one, uh, not last near death experience that I come to think of is 20, sorry, 2016, uh, when uh, the, the then CEO Riku Mäkelä gave an interview in, a, I think it was a magazine called Image, um, around the time when we were finishing off our early bird discount campaign. So early bird is our last discount campaign before we move to normal bird, like uh, normal pricing. So it happens, it usually happens around September, October. And it was the, the last week of early bird and early bird, of course, being the last like price incentive is uh, a week in which we sell a huge amount of tickets. And the broader logic, like economic logic of, of hosting an event is you pay costs up front and then you carry like you reel that back in with your late ticket sales because, you know, such ticket sales like like any event look like this. Basically, it's a, it's a hockey stick coming up to the event. And uh, on that week, that last week of early bird, Rico Mekela gave an interview an image saying like this week we're going to know if Slush goes bankrupt or not. Because that was a year when we had started so many big projects like the Nerdbird. So that was the direct flight from San Francisco to Helsinki. We had expanded the events from the previous year. Uh, and, and it was all just run on this, like these tiny margins. Like basically they knew that if everything goes okay, uh, we're going to be left with like 5% of margin at the end of early bird before we go back. Around. And it was actually very close to, to happening. But uh, but uh, eventually the ticket sales caught up in that last week and, and Slush did not go bankrupt. And I think since then, um, our board's advice to us has been to build a bit more of a cash buffer and not take huge risk. Because of, of course, these days, Slush is not an event you can, you know, let's go bankrupt. It, it has a certain legacy. It means something to people. Uh, you know, back then it maybe wasn't so much. So not sure that I answered the, the question directly, but uh, those are probably the three times when, when Slush almost, you know, stopped to cease to exist. Um, so so there's a there's a couple. All right. Thank you for explaining those. I think, yeah. like, I will call it near death experience, <laughs> where you are like, it's either you you succeed and move on, or you just die. You know, which is very scary. I'm I'm I'm, I'm happy that the slush was able to make it through, so we still have slush to attend. Yeah. Uh, well, also just as a point that that's also a reality of a lot of early stage startups like for a lot of early stage startups each of their fundraisers is, is this like close to near the experience like you're at the end of your runway you need funding to stay alive so it's also a part of startup life uh, i think mm -hmm. there's a question from maria uh the question is not that clear but i'll just try to read it out maybe you can get some idea from it how is the information communicated to potential guests yeah, I guess that gets to kind of how do we actually make sure that, you know, 8,000 or back in the day, 20,000 people find their way to Helsinki and like know what to do here. Um, and um, yeah, I guess the, um, 
well, let me be super neat, like super concrete here, because uh, maybe that's the way, way this should be answered. Uh, the way a lot of event works, events work is you have a um, you have your kind of outbound sales. So you have a newsletter, you have social media channels, et cetera, et cetera, that you use to sell tickets. And, uh, you know, probably every year after the event, you aggregate those. So you get more social media followers, you get more newsletter followers and so on. And, and then you have like a nice pipeline to sell with. Um, the, 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 the thing that happens in most events, including Slush, when you buy a ticket is not only do you get your ticket, but you also get added to this other like newsletter, which is typically uh, like a, a newsletter for like an event communications newsletter. So a, a, a like a registered attendee or like, uh, you know, bought ticket attendee type of newsletter. And, and that's then the uh, primary source of source of information over, over the course of the fall. So you, you know, you try and be timely in letting people know about stuff when they're interested to hear about it because of course if you uh, tell people what cafe they should visit in, in Helsinki three months before it won't be of much interest to them so of course you need to be like sensible about timing of information and so on um, and then the actual difficult part about event comms is because some people buy their tickets super late to the events they will have missed all of the previous event communications and you need to have some place of, of uh, kind of getting them back on track um, and uh, I, I don't know that we have the best method for that uh, closer to uh, like closer to slush, our, our our website becomes the primary source of like of static information. So you should be able to find everything on our website. And then uh, you know even closer to the event, we advise everyone to download our event application, which should have everything you you need to know. So if you haven't checked a single newsletter, if you just come to Helsinki, not knowing what to do, um, as long as you're here on the right date and open the app, you you should be advised. Um, so that's maybe the most specific answer I can give without like going into huge amounts of detail. So I hope that helps at least uh, a little bit. Yeah, I think that uh, slush event app, it was super he he helpful, like uh, for the period I was attending slush, even though you registered late, for example, or like you missed some newsletter or some info in the app, you can literally see everything. And it helps in terms of navigation around, you know, where are the, the events happening, like the sessions, the side events, and all of those. And uh, I think uh, like at some point we had to give some feedback in terms of that app. And I think it was one of the it was one of the things that made Slush super accessible during Slush, because during Slush, nobody's gonna answer you where is this happening? Everybody's busy, running heads are scattered, you know, stuff like that. So having that app, I think it's been a very, very huge source for Slush in terms of being self-service. So people literally just go to the app and get what they want to get, and they don't even need to start looking for where is the team or the info team to ask questions and stuff like that. So that has been like a very good point. I think you guys should keep it up. When are we expecting the new app for this year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's coming. And I think you actually, Calvin, made a point that I didn't make, which is very good, uh, which is um, you know to pay credit to the uh, all the volunteers that help put Slush together. So this year, there'll be more, more than a thousand of them. And of course, um, information is our info team which uh you know uh, sort of mans these in info desks around the venue and are always there to help our attendees uh and are, are very useful and then there's another team which is uh, our speaker buddies team so actually if you speak at slush you get offered a personal sort of slush volunteer concierge who will you know he will help you around when you're in helsinki so our volunteers do help when, when people are all right i have one interesting question from my side how did Slush get this big? Can you take us back in time? <laughs> How was it like in the first days? Like, I'm not sure you were there, but no, maybe you already know. You, you like you saw so somebody might have told the story over and over and over again. How was it back then? And how did it get to this point where it becomes like I don't know one of the largest tech events in the world? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a good question. Um, yeah, so Slush did start out very small. Like the first student organized Slush in in twenty eleven was a was uh, well at least this claimed to have been a thousand and five hundred people. I'm I'm not sure it actually was that many. And it was really like a like I think Miki the the main organizer then would be the first one to tell you that it was this like hustled student uh, event where like no one knew what they were gonna do and as much as students and a, and a couple of international investors who had somehow stumbled upon it and made their made their way to Helsinki. I think the uh, 
the, the, the biggest causal reason behind Slush's growth, as with actually most startups, is uh, is timing. So we got super lucky with when uh, when Slush started out. Because if you think about, if you think back to, uh, if you think back to 2011, that's just around the time when Rovio had had taken off as this sort of first big international, uh, you know, Finnish uh, startup success story. Um, uh, Supercell was in its foundational stages. I think Clash of Clans and Hey There were launched in in 2012. So this was at the really at the like the, the birthplace and the birth time of of the Finnish startup ecosystem. And I think in 2012, in 2013, as Rovio and Supercell grew in stature and people started to know about them, that really boosted Slush. And it boosted Slush in a couple of ways. One was there were suddenly people in Finland who were super connected in the global startup ecosystem. Someone like Ilka Bonan is probably the one. So founder. Supercell, uh, still CEO of Supercell, is, is probably the one person who has helped slush the most over the years, like uh, if, if you discard the team. So, um, you know, he suddenly knew people, you know, all around the world to invite the speakers and, and was just incredibly helpful. You know, Peter Vestarbakka was incredibly helpful. And there were all these people who suddenly, uh, you know, had some influence and some networks in the startup ecosystem. Equally, I think people became interested in this Nordic phenomenon, which was mainly then games companies, later it's become of all kinds of sizes but there's like the fact that in the span of a couple of years a small country in 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 northern europe which you may never have heard of produces two unicorn size uh tech success stories so that's companies that grow to a valuation of more than a billion dollars so people became super interested in this phenomenon like this special sort of nordic uh, you know sauce if you will and i think that really really helps us grow uh but then of course there's also many things that i think by virtue of luck or by virtue of uh, you know being, 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 being you know consciously doing so, uh, we got right along the way. Um, uh, and and then I think one causal thing is what I mentioned earlier is just the huge risk with which slush was was grown each year. So uh, you know all of the money in the bank was put into organizing the event up until ticket sales revenue came to uh, you know started to come in. So basically. You know, since Slush is not a, like a VC funded, like an externally funded company and has never taken on a loan, we're obviously have to, our own cash flow has to, you know, fund whatever we do. And I think we just took the maximum conceivable amount of risk that you could in each year between sort of 2011 and 2016. Um, and yeah, then Slush grew. I mean, by sort of 2017, it was up to around 20,000 people. And, and that's sort of where it, where it plateaued. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I could go on, uh, but uh, that's some of the answer. Thank you so much for that answer. We're actually getting closer to the end of the session. It's been a bit over an hour already, and I think you've covered a lot of stuff.